welcome to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I'm Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann. And welcome to this episode of Commission Ed. So, Colin, we were kind of joking about this. It's never a good day when the Intel guy leads off, right? right. A little bit of a Debbie Downer here. But in all seriousness, this is going to be a little bit of a heavy episode. So we are recording this early April. We are right now about six weeks into the war in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And immediately upon the initiation of the conflict, Colin, we've been talking about this conflict. Yeah. And we've had some ideas bouncing around for a while, but we really wanted to see a little bit more how things were going to play out to better scope what we wanted to discuss, because there yeah. is a lot. We could have started talking about this on the podcast immediately in yeah. the lead up to like we had stuff to share, but we knew it wasn't the right time. Yeah. Yeah. And we can't sit anymore. We've got to discuss some of these things. The opportunity for critical growth. We cannot pass this up. And I don't mean to make light of the situation or make it seem like it's all intellectual, but we've got to discuss this stuff. Yep. So 24 February 2022, Russia invaded Ukraine. As a reminder, this is the second time in the right. last eight years. So uh, let us not forget the the invasion into Crimea. But this has largely been viewed as the largest kinetic conflict in Europe and essentially the Western world since World War II in terms of the stakes involved, in terms of the international response. There's a lot going on here. And the chief of staff and the chief master sergeant of the Air Force have been beating the table for years yeah. that we need to elevate our understanding of near-peer conflict, of global competition. And this is an opportunity to use this exact conflict right now mm -hmm. to make that change. And so yep. a couple of things we need to talk about, right, to kind of get us all on the same page and help us understand what we want you all to be thinking about. We want to talk about instruments of national power. So what are instruments of national power? Instruments of national power are the means available to a government to influence the behaviors, beliefs, and perspectives of other nations or people in the pursuit of national objectives. Okay, that's right. that super intellectual booky definition. We'll talk about it. We'll break it down. Yeah. It's the stuff and things we have in order to get other countries and people to do what we want. Yep. That's the most simple way to do it. And there are a lot of ways to break this down. We're going to use kind of the most canonical, most basic form. It's called the DIME, and it stands yep. for Diplomatic, Informational, Military, and Economic. So these are the tools the levers we can pull, right, on the, the yep. grand keyboard of control to try and influence other nations. Other organizations have tried to make this a little bit more fine, like adding in law, adding another eye for intelligence, and you've got like midfield and dime fill and some other, they've broken this down in different ways, but dime is kind of the most, most basic, easiest to kind of start with. Yeah, it'll serve our purposes here today. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, Colin, why don't you give us a rundown of kind of the basic idea of diplomatic as an instrument of national power? Like, how do we use that tool to get stuff done? Yeah, sure. So when we talk diplomacy, we're talking leaders of nations, your presidents, your prime ministers, secretariats, think State Department, places where you know, anytime there's an embassy or an ambassador involved, Anything that deals with negotiations between nations for things like treaties or accords or something like that, or think like the United Nations, where many nations are coming together to discuss and try to arrive at solutions. That's what we mean by diplomatic. Yeah, it's literally people talking to each other. Yeah. 
<laughs> now it takes a lot of different forms as you described. Yeah, and you say that as if <laughs> as if it's easy, but it as is if not. it's easy. And yeah. Or that the United Nations gets a really bad rap, right? Mm -hmm. That it's an organization of no consequence. It has no real power. And maybe there's some truth to that. But the reality is that if we want to avoid some of the other things that we'll talk about later, especially with the military side of things, the best way to do that is to get people in a room and have them talk, to see eye to eye, listen, and try to arrive at a solution that is not going to require shooting at each other. Yeah. And we've talked about this when we talked about theories of um, geopolitics, right, and international relations, liberalism, the idea that organizations mm -hmm. and international organizations form the basis for national decision making. It is highly regarded and widely accepted across all you know, think tanks that the liberal democratic and free market based society, in other words, a group of nations who have decided to use diplomatic as their primary instrument has led to the widest amount of peace and prosperity in mankind's history. So yeah, I know I said it's just a bunch of people <laughs> talking to each other, but that is by no means to diminish how powerful this is. It is truly a critical yeah. aspect of the levers of national power. It is massively important. Yeah, which is why it's first. Yeah, which is why it's first. Totally agree. I'm going to run down informational because this is kind of one as a information warfare line of the air force operator. This is definitely more in my bailiwick. So this is informational. This takes a lot of forms, but the basic idea is that the more information is more widely known, it increases the ability of the nations who are sharing and have this information. It increases their decision space and potentially limits the decision space of our adversaries. So this comes mm -hmm. in the form of press releases. This is uh, media. This is getting intelligence shared widely throughout the world, communications, forums. The more information that is being shared more broadly, it can limit decision space for adversaries. Yeah. And we're going to talk about some specifics as we go through and look at the current conflict to highlight this, but that's the basic idea. The next one, this one we're all kind of familiar with, military. But I think mm -hmm. we want to explain it a little bit more in depth because when we think military, we're like, okay, this is, I'm going to make you do what I want by punching you in the face until you do what I want. <laughs> that is a big part of it, but it's not all. <laughs> I think even just having military forces positioned someplace can have an impact. Yeah. Having a base. Yeah. Shows a force. Yeah. Having a base in South Korea. We're not shooting anybody. But we're there. And that makes North Korean yeah. decision making different. That's an example yep. of using military that's not kinetic, but it has an impact on what we're trying to do. But yes, this is, it can be exactly what we think it is direct combat operations forcing another nation to do what we want. All right, Colin, why don't you do a rundown of the final letter in our dime, the E, economic? The economic side of things is just as it sounds, you know. We're talking about trade, movement of goods and services doesn't necessarily have to be money specifically, but obviously it's going to be involved when we're talking about economic stuff. But it's also like the policy surrounding those things. You know, what are the regulations that govern trade between nations? You know, what are the tariffs or boycotts or how are we helping or hurting the movement of goods and services between nations? Exactly. That's awesome. Okay, so we've introduced these instruments of national power because what we want to explore now is why things are different now. The military that you entered, whether you entered it, you know, 21 February and any time before, it's different. <laughs> it's different. Yeah, things yeah. are different now. And how we're going to explore that is we're going to use the example of the dime and those instruments of power to discuss why many of these levers were unavailable or largely unavailable in GWAT. And then we're going to show examples of how they're being used in this current conflict to show you why we've got to up our game. We've got to improve. So think about global war on terror. Yep. Um, one of the most important things that, Colin, you mentioned, it's first for a reason, the D, diplomatic. 
One of the most important tools that we have is the ability to negotiate, to sit down and talk with people. The problem with that aspect in GWAT, that was counter to our national objectives. Recognizing a terrorist organization yeah. as a valid mouthpiece for a government or a region or a group of people was directly counter to our national objectives. Yeah. In other words, we basically neutered that entire aspect of our instruments of national power. It was just the IME. Yeah, D was off the table. And that doesn't mean that we didn't try. That doesn't mean that we didn't, you know, find ways to try and bring it in. But it certainly shows how different, especially when you compare to, you know, the current conflict. And we'll talk about that in a second. But that's one example. The next one is E, the economic. So it's at the end, but it is certainly not the least of these four options, right? Right. The problem, again, with GWAT is you have a small group of terrorists who overwhelmingly are part of a society and organization, a country, and by sanctioning, by reducing trade, by fiscal policies, embargoes, all those tools that we have, we could be negatively impacting the rest of the population whose hearts yep. and minds we are trying to recruit to our side of the table. Yet we're actually making their lives worse. So maybe the terrorists have a good point. And so it becomes this vicious cycle of how do we build an economy? How do we improve the status and lives of the people that are here without helping the terrorists at the same time? Oh, wow, this is a really hard problem. And we can see what happens in Afghanistan for over a 20 year conflict, right? Yep. This is very hard. And so your economic lever is also largely unavailable. So what does that leave us, Colin? We have reduced our ability to maneuver. We have information and military, and that's it. And so guess what? We did. We blew stuff up. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we did. And we used a lot of intel to find stuff to blow up. Yep. Yet we can see how challenging of a problem this was. And before we move on to kind of talk about examples of the current conflict, I want to make sure we say... To all of those GWAT warriors, we don't want you to feel minimized. We don't want to feel, un, you know, that underappreciated or in any way diminish that conflict or what it meant to this country. It was the right thing at the right time, but things are changing and we're trying to highlight those things. So I just want to make sure we got that covered. Yeah, I mean, we were part of that. That's how we came into the Air Force and we grew up in GWAT. So to minimize it for others would be to minimize it for us. Not that we want to be selfish and, and congratulate ourselves on the things that we accomplished, but like we did some real things for the Air Force during that time. Yeah, absolutely. I just, before we moved much farther, I wanted to make sure and get that out there. You know, just things are different and we need to up our game and that's what we're talking about. So let's run through the dime and use that as a lens to examine things that are going on right now in the current conflict and highlight to those in the audience what is going on here. So Colin, you've got some, you know, we're looking at a shared Google Doc here where we've got some links, but we'll just kind of start walking through it. So diplomatic examples, right? So the UN, about a month after the conflict started, voted, it adopted resolutions to criticize Russia and saying, you guys are in the wrong, right? That is an example of an international organization diplomatically trying to change Russian behavior. Yeah. And that's a singular moment. The UN has been very busy constantly. I mean, what else are they going to talk about right now? This is it. And so where this is just a isolated event or a very specific vote that came out of the UN, they are constantly in those negotiations, trying to find a way, looking for solutions, looking for ways to resolve this conflict in the best way possible. Yeah. What are some other ones that you can think of, you know, kind of off the top of your head? So that's the United Nations. Let's look at the United States specifically and how we are using our diplomatic arm to influence the direction of this conflict. Perfect example was that President Biden visited Poland for the express purpose of meeting with NATO to encourage them to show a presence and a commitment for the NATO partners, but also to Russia saying, we are 100% committed to our NATO allies. We are fully committed to Article 5 that if any member of NATO is attacked, we hold that sacred and we will respond in kind. Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. There have been ongoing negotiations between Russia and Ukraine. Ukraine has applied for and I believe been accepted into the European Union. I -hmm. mean, the number of these international organizations and diplomatic forums has really ramped up really remarkably. There's been a lot in this space. It's really easy to find examples of the D in the dime being used and hopefully to great effect. You know, time will tell. Yeah. So informational, this one will be a little bit tough for me, but there have been a lot of really good examples of informational. So if you just Google intelligence success, predicting Russia invasion, uh, you'll see quite a few links and discussions about this. Yeah. But yes, there was a lot of information. People knew this was going to happen or very likely to happen. And we got that information out. And that's just one example where, you know, information intelligence was pushed out to the world quickly in order to, again, try and influence. If you tell your adversary, this is what you're going to do tomorrow, it gives them a moment to say, hmm, if they know my playbook, maybe maybe I shouldn't do this. That's just one example. What are some others that you think about as you think about information? Well, I think about how this is playing out on the Russian side of things. You know, what is the information that is being delivered to Vladimir Putin? Is it correct? Is it incorrect? Is it timely or has it been degraded over the course of time? And obviously I'm not in the Intel community. I don't have those answers, but there are some who are claiming that Putin's advisors misinformed him either because they didn't have the right information or because they feared telling him the truth or something along those lines. We can see how information is uh, playing out on both sides of this conflict. Yeah, exactly. No, really good points. Okay. Um, We're not going to do the military right now because we're going to use that as our transition point. We're going to talk about economics because that's one that's really common and out there in the space, right? And is hitting our pocketbooks as we pull up to the gas station, all of those who are still (laughs) driving internal combustion engine vehicles, right? The economic sanctions of all this, right? So Russia was banned from SWIFT, you know, the International Exchange Forum. It's a banking tool. I'm not a super economics guy, but it seems important. I've done some reading about it. But the global response to this invasion has been widespread, severe sanctions of Russia, Russian companies, Russian technology, etc. Gas is not flowing through, you know, these, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, you know, into Germany, the list goes on of things that have happened, companies have withdrawn, you know, events in Russia have been canceled. And all of this is to try and sever Russia from the means, the physical means that they need in order to continue to conduct operations. Yeah, sever them from the ability to conduct operations, but also just to apply pressure Mm -hmm. in another way to bend specifically Vladimir Putin's desires to continue the conflict. Exactly. Yeah. And those ones are pretty straightforward. Really easy to find those in the news and, and in what's going on. And we are feeling that a little bit, right? Russia is a large net exporter of oil. And so the cost of oil has increased. Oil equals gasoline, right? It's very easy to kind of see all this playing out. Yeah. The last one that we're going to talk about is the M, is the military, because this one is a little bit tricky, but it's also a really good launching point for Colin, some real good discussion about some things that we are taking out of this and that we really want to communicate. So what have we seen? Military-wise, because last I checked, the U.S. is not shooting down Russian aircraft. No, they're not. But our military is definitely involved in projecting power, right? It shows a force by sending F-35s from Hill Air Force Base to Germany. You know, and this, this happened like even before things started. This was you know February 22nd, the F-35s there. So like we knew something was going to happen and we needed to show force to encourage our NATO allies and signal to Russia that we knew what was up and we're ready for it. Along those lines, you have 7,000 personnel deployed to Poland and Romania right along the border in the event that the conflict spills over or just to prevent it from coming any closer to our allies. Yeah. Something I want to point out about that is NATO has been going on for a little while, right? As an idea. So that'll come in later as I bring in some of my biggest take-homes. 
right, is the time frame involved with some of this calculus. But yeah, NATO has been going on for decades. And so these are not things that you can just decide and build overnight. <laughs> these are slow burn, longer term things that we have to be thinking about. But yeah, it also could include delivery of a lethal aid of stinger and javelin weapons. You know, there was a lot of kerfuffle about Poland delivering MiG-29s to Ukraine. There's a lot of stuff going on in this that doesn't equal U.S. personnel shooting at Russian personnel. Yeah. And still have the ability to use military as an instrument of power. So let's use that, Colin, as our launching point. Why are we talking about this in the context of this? What's the take home? What's the so what? Yeah. So we are talking about this because we as members of the military need to understand how the military specifically, but really the entire thing operates, how these instruments of power operate in order to achieve the nation's objectives, especially in regards to this particular conflict. Now, so what are our objectives? What are the United States objectives with regards to the conflict between Russia and Ukraine? There are really two main things that we care about right now. It's that one, the war ends on terms that Ukraine is able to accept. And then two, that we discourage any sort of escalation in the conflict by Putin and Russian forces. And I would like to add one to that, Colin, real fast. Sure, go ahead. Also, that the global world order continues to discourage any behavior like this. Yes. Because that's a key thing about this, right? The, it's not just the border area between Russia and Ukraine that's up for grabs. It's the entire concept of what it means to be a country and what's allowed. Yeah. Is it okay if another country just shoots a bunch of aircraft down and then moves in and absorbs, you know, 10 million square acres for themselves? And we're just like, yeah, as long as you didn't kill a, too many civilians, right? Like, like there's a lot at stake here. Yeah. It's showing the world what is the kind of behavior that nations can engage in and what is socially, internationally acceptable, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thanks for adding that one in there. And so when we look at these different objectives, these different instruments of power, anything that we do in the diplomatic information, military or economic spaces that doesn't support or achieve those goals must be avoided. And that is especially true in the military space because diplomatic information and economic stuff is often reversible. I mean, there are some instances where things can't be reversed, you know, loss of capital kind of things. But in the military space, when you break something or you kill somebody, there's no way to fix that. Yeah. And so we need to be very judicious in the way that we choose to employ military power towards the goal of achieving these national objectives. Yeah. And these activities, right, these instruments, they're not mutually exclusive. They right. all influence each other. They all touch each other. And so that actually, you know, is one of my biggest take homes, Colin, of this conflict and what our young leaders, developing leaders need to be thinking about is the necessity to raise the bar of your understanding of the whole of government and your role in it. Mm -hmm. Because gone are the days where we're just going to achieve air superiority and that's going to be an existing condition that we then operate in. Yeah, There's actually a really good, there's a document called the Air Superiority 2030 Flight Plan. And this is the Air Force forecasting. This was written in 2016, but they're forecasting what the future of conflict looks like. And I'm just going to read a quick paragraph right here. It's on the very first page. In common discourse, air superiority is often envisioned as a theater-wide condition. In highly contested environments, such a conception may be unrealistic and unnecessary. Air superiority is only needed for the time and over the geographic area required to enable joint operations. The specific amount of time and space required vary significantly across scenarios, mission objectives, and phases of conflict. In other words, Colin, we grew up in a world where we owned the air. Yeah. We didn't have air superiority. We had air supremacy. Yeah. No questions asked, right? We Bad guys in caves with beards don't have advanced fighter aircraft. So we could move through the air, that domain, we completely owned it. And what we're saying and what we're seeing is that air superiority 
has to change. Even the idea of air superiority, which we always have envisioned as, oh, we go in, we shoot down planes, we kill their air defenses, and then we own the air. We can't even think about that as a given anymore. And that's kind of the level of discourse that we're talking about here. We really need to adjust the scope and scale of our understanding of the whole of government and your role in it. And it's not just like field grade officers and commanders either, right? We got to push this all the way down. Yeah. And to put it in the context of the conflict here, what you're saying here is that we can achieve success, those objectives that we just talked about for our nation without having air superiority all the time over Ukraine. There are ways that we can get to where we need to be without our aircraft flying over Ukraine and forcing a no-fly zone. And we'll get into more of that specific topic of a no-fly zone and all those things at another point. Like, for example, you know, Reed and I are not pilots. We're not analysts. We're not experts in this area, but we're going to bring people who are onto the show to talk about that very thing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. We're also... We're not going to give like a really detailed breakdown of this conflict. We're talking about the general principles that can be observed because we're going to find people who are experts on the conflict and we're going to try to get them on. We've got a couple things in the hopper. Pretty excited about that. So yeah, totally agreed because we need to recognize, and I kind of alluded to this, but chief of staff and chief master sergeant of the Air Force, they have been demanding that we understand more about peer conflict coming out of basic training. This is not yeah. just like advanced, oh, when you go to, you know, some strategic air conference, you're going to think deep thoughts and smoke cigars in, you know, oak-lined rooms. No, this is like from the minute you join the Air Force, you got to be thinking about this stuff because it's no longer we can fly wherever we want and do whatever we want, and it's just us. It's a bigger deal now. Well, I think— I would argue it's even before you get into your commissioning source or you show up at basic training, you need to be thinking about things as American citizens, because we know that we have people who are listening to this show who are not in the Air Force yet, who need to be thinking about these things because they are going to play some part in the D, the I, or the E, right? Yes, exactly. And, you know, if you are complaining about gas prices and you're you're blowing up your Twitter feed and you're you're writing angry letters to your congressman about how things are so expensive now, you can take a breath. You can wait a minute and you can see why things are happening the way they are. And then you can be more informed and act accordingly, even as a non-member of the military. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And the information lever of as an instrument of national power is very fascinating. And I know we're going to talk about this in a minute because of the increased reach mm -hmm. and speed and availability of the ability for an average Joe to get their message heard. You can yeah. be a player in the information space. <laughs> you can also be an adversary. Yeah, no, that's and that's exactly what I'm getting at. What you yeah. like and subscribe to, what you share, what you click, what you say. You can be a player in that space, and that is absolutely happening. Yeah. And what we're getting at, all of this is we could kind of boil it down, you know, to this small sentence. Welcome to the rest of your career. Everything is different now. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we're talking about. So from a leadership perspective, Colin, I think this is a really good point. We have seen some really fascinating leadership lessons. And why don't you kind of break down some of those things that we're seeing out of Zelensky, out of Ukraine, that are just fascinating from a leadership yeah. perspective. Yeah, so I really wanted to take a closer look at the lessons we could learn directly from Vladimir Zelensky. You know, he's become the Western world's darling poster child, not even child, but poster leader. He has become the quintessential wartime leader that everybody should look to and follow. Now, I'm not saying that we as members of the United States military should be looking to Zelensky for direction and leadership. That's not what I'm saying. But there are things in the way that he is behaving, acting, leading, things that we can learn and apply back to ourselves. I mean, he's an extremely charismatic person in that he is likable. He's well-spoken. He's out there in front. He's visible. You know, great case in point is like when he does interviews, he's not in a suit and tie. 
He's essentially a wartime fatigue type uniform. He's sitting on the stairs with interviewers, with reporters, having these conversations. Right? He is putting out there a persona of leadership that is very different from what we, certainly what we are seeing in Vladimir Putin, right? Contrast those two different leadership styles, but also you know, just leadership in the Western world, certainly leadership that we're used to in the military. There are ways that Zelensky is behaving that we can really learn from. And dare I you know, plug our three C's, right? We're seeing his character. We're seeing his competence. We're seeing his connection to other people. And thereby, he is showing up as a very trustworthy person that people are wanting to follow. And I think there's a whole host of lessons that we as leaders in the military and in the Air Force can learn from. Yeah, totally agree. One example from the Western world where I think this was done well was when George Bush showed up to Ground Zero shortly after 9-11, mm -hmm. right? That's another example of being there, you know, being with the people. And Zelensky is absolutely doing that. And as a leader, right, it is not a good look to always be in your office commanding from the ivory tower. Yeah, that is not a good look. <laughs> don't don't be that person who people are like, oh, what's wrong? The officers here, you know, <laughs> like <laughs> like like if that's the message that comes from your leadership style. Uh oh, what did I do? The O's here like that's not a good look, especially in a situation where things are going poorly. Not that things are going poorly for the Ukrainians right now. Yes, they're being invaded. So that is poor. But in conflict. When your people are having to do the thing, when they're out there actively doing the mission, you should be there with them, leading from the front. Not saying that you need to pick up a rifle and lead the charge downrange. That's not the officer's role in many circumstances. But are you there with them? Are you present? Are you available? Are you offering encouragement? Are you communicating the vision at every stage, at every point, helping the mission to get accomplished? Yeah. And that exactly, you know, is that point I made, you know, my big take home. You have to understand what your role is and play your role very well. The next thing I think is really apparent in this conflict that we can see, and there's a lot of lessons, kind of leads me to my next big point, is the multitude of aspects that make this 21st century warfare. Mm -hmm. You've got multi-domain ops, right? We've got space going on. We've got cyber going on. We've got human terrain. We've got the threat of nuclear war. There are still tanks and armored personnel carriers and artillery, and there's still aircraft and all of those, you know, more traditional things. But then you've got, you know, like Anonymous saying, we're going to take down Russian websites. Yeah. And they will, and they do. Like, who are these people? They're, you know, they're not a nation state, but they're acting in cyber. I mean, 21st century warfare is wicked complex. Mm -hmm. And my big take home as a leader, something that we need to be doing and we need to be doing it earlier and we need to be doing it more often is we need to deepen and widen our perspective of the spectrum that is military operations. Yeah. You know, if you think about, you know, using an, an example of digital graphics, right? Gone are the days where you can have a spectrum of conflict. One end of the spectrum is like, we're literally shooting at each other, right? The other yep. end of the spectrum is we're doing an exchange between military officers to build relationships. You know, like yep. it's not conflict, but it's something it's interacting, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Those are the extremes. You can't have like an eight bit scale, right? Yeah. <laughs> the, the number of colors that you have to have on your understanding of, of the spectrum of military operations needs to expand because we're talking the difference between, you know, elevating tensions is I decided to fly this, you know, reconnaissance sortie three nautical miles closer to the border than we usually do, but still in international waters. Is that escalatory? Yeah. Is that provocative? You know, these are words you're going to hear on the news and in other forums. Putin elevated the alert level of his nuclear forces, right? He sent an email to his nuclear forces and it led the whole world to react. This is yep. the kind of stuff we're talking about. We need like the 8K television screen version <laughs> of, of 16 million bits. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All the all the different colors. Mm -hmm. Not that you have to be an expert, that you personally 
have to be an expert in every single one of those things. That's not the case, but you need to be definitely more informed than just eight bits. And it needs to start earlier. It needs to be more frequent. You need to have more time and experience with these different instruments of power, especially the range of military options so that you can see how you fit into all of those different things. And when the opportunity comes, you are able to lead more effectively. Yeah, totally agree. And Colin, my last big take home of what we're seeing and principles that we can learn and apply, we need to completely change our perspective of time. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. How conflict evolves, how we deal with time. And this is another contrary. I know we've talked about these a lot over the last few months, but this is another really interesting contrary. So it's really easy to see in the press that we had been warning for a very long time that Russia was going to do something. Yeah. Right. But it started really eight years ago in 2014 with the invasion of Crimea, mm-hmm. right? This is, this is logically an extension of that. Yeah. And, you know, we're not going to get into all the details of everything here. You could even consider that it goes beyond that. Talk about the invasion of Georgia in 2008. Yep. You know, I mean, this could really roll back. And what I'm getting at is that the conflict, the time frame, the scale and of the time involved for this type of near peer competition, great power competition conflict is in terms of years and decades. Yeah. Right. These are very long, slow burn that can be, as we're experiencing now, punctuated by extremely violent short time frame things. I don't know how long this conflict's going to go, but you know, I remember Colin, you and I were texting and you're like, maybe we should, you know, have this episode go out when this is over. (laughs) <laughs> and and my response back How to you, idealist of me. Yeah, well, and, and my response back was like, that's not going to happen for a very long time. I don't foresee this ending soon. This is the next 20, 30, 40, 50 year issue. And yet I want to contrast that with the changing culture in the United States military with respect to how long people are going to stay in. Yeah. We got rid of the high three all or nothing retirement system. We've talked about that, you know, a little bit here and there, pros and cons. But what it means, though, is that people are going to be coming in and out of the military much more quickly. Yeah. There's bigger societal changes going on to, you know, kind of gone are the days where the company man or woman gets hired with, you know, name large Fortune 500 and they stay there for 40 years. Their children and grandchildren all work for the same company. Those days are gone. And so if we're fighting a war call it Cold War 2.0, you know, that's up for discussion. But if we're fighting an adversary where conflict evolves over years and decades, yet our people are rotating in and out in five years instead of 15, Mm -hmm. how are you as a leader preparing your people for that? Yeah. And I think the answer is you need to get them more training and more smart more quickly and push responsibility and delegation empowerment down further. Yeah. Because you can't afford to be like, oh, well, I'm not going to trust you until you've got 10 years in. Right. They're not going to be in for 10 years. And then we're going to see what we see in Russia, which is an entirely conscripted enlisted force, which is not working for them. Just going to leave that there. We'll let our experts explore those ideas, you know, hopefully in future episodes. But those are kind of my big take-homes is contrary of time. And we've got to change the way we think about it. We can't allow ourselves to say, you're not good enough until you're a mid-level captain. We cannot allow that. Yeah. And the application back to us as officers is how, how do we affect that? How do we get people the training as quickly as they can, get them to an operational level as quickly as we can, take advantage of those people while we've got them, you know, to accomplish the mission, but then also recognize that they have the option to leave at any point. And so it's incumbent on us to one, find ways to encourage them to continue to serve so that they can be an asset to the Air Force for a a longer term. And two, prepare them for their next step where they are going to leave the Air Force, go back into the private business world or whatever it is that they want to do and continue to be part of the dime in the D and the I and the E. Because every single person, every citizen of the United States is part of this conflict. 
whether they like it or not, whether they know it or not. And we have a responsibility to prepare our people to be successful in the Air Force as well as on the outside. Yeah, agree. All right. So, Colin, Intel guys, definitely Debbie down for a while. Why don't <laughs> why don't we kind of pick it up on some of the big take homes and kind of leave it with, you know, kind of the biggest take home that you've got, I think is a great message. And I totally agree with. So why don't you pick it up for right here? So there was an article that came out in the Atlantic and we'll link it in the description because I think it's worth everybody reading for a number of reasons. It talks about Napoleon's three to one advantage of you know, the moral over the physical, those kinds of things. Really interesting from a war theory type of perspective, but also just the anecdotes, the personal stories that are being shared in this article are really interesting to see what things are like on the ground. Now, that all said, I'm going to spoil the whole article for you <laughs> because the last paragraph is so instructive, so important that I have to share it here. I still want you all to go read the article for the reasons I've shared, but this, this piece of it really brings everything home brings this conflict into perspective in a way that I don't think anything else could quite as well. So there's a conversation between two former Marines. One is fighting on the ground on behalf of the Ukrainian people. The other is the reporter, and they're sharing stories back and forth. But the reporter says that as they were sharing these thoughts back and forth, talking about the reforms and technologies that were giving the Ukrainians their advantage, the other Marine who was there fighting was quick to point out the one variable that he believed trumped everything else. He said, quote, our motivation, it is the most important factor, more important than anything. We're fighting for the lives of our families, for our people, and for our homes. The Russians don't have any of that, and there's nowhere they can go to get it." End quote. I want that to settle in for a second. When we look at 21st century warfare and everything that comes with it, especially when we look at the complications of multi-domain operations, fighting under threat of nuclear war, and everything that that means, there are things that you absolutely must have in order to be successful. And we could argue back and forth on what those must-haves might be, air superiority, logistics, technology, space assets, intelligence, or whatever. You know, there are so many different things that we could argue about we must have in order to be successful. But when you really look at it, especially against the backdrop between a smaller nation like Ukraine going up against the big superpower of Russia, what is it that gives them their advantage? It is their reason for fighting. If we are going to be successful as a military in any conflict, doesn't matter what it is, doesn't matter to the extent, whether it's kinetic, non-kinetic, or whatever. If we don't have good and right reasons for fighting, you lose. If nothing else, you lose on the moral ground of things. And if you lose the moral side, it's very, very hard to win on the physical side. The Ukrainians are fighting for their families, for their people, for their country, for their homes, in a way that cannot be replicated by the Russians. Are the Russians bad people? No. Listen to me. We do not hate Russians. Russians are people every bit as much as Ukrainians are people. But the circumstances that the Russians find themselves in, those that are on the ground fighting in Ukraine, in no way mirror or even look similar to that of the Ukrainians. Yeah. They are not fighting for their families. They are not fighting for their people or their homes. If you have any doubt about the importance of those things, just look at how many times it's been reported that those things are being manufactured. The mm -hmm. reasons for the Russian motivation to go to war have been manufactured. That's widely reported because this idea, the reason has to be central. Yeah. And you could turn it that back on us in GWAT, not to put us on the same ground as the Russians in Ukraine, but you know, there are similarities in that we invaded a country where we were not necessarily fighting for 
our homes, our people, our country in the same way. So if we want to be successful, we have to get the reasons for fighting right. So folks, this has been, you know, a heavy episode, lots going on, big take homes, right? We have got to push the level of our understanding of war, of conflict, of our role in all of this. We've got to get it sooner. We've got to get it faster. We've got to get it better. And this is an opportunity. What is going on right now is an opportunity for you to see and be involved and to be a player in the dime right now, whatever your station, whatever you're doing. And we encourage you to do that. Colin, we've talked about how we're going to try to get some experts on this specific conflict and some very, you know, really heady discussions about what's going on so we can even elevate that a little bit more. We're hoping to bring those in the next few episodes. You know, fingers crossed we can pull all that together. But yeah, really want to take this opportunity to thank you and to, again, we're grateful that you guys are joining us on this journey as we try to get to be better leaders because our folks deserve it. And so do the reasons we fight for. Yeah. Anything else before we wrap up today, Colin? Let's hope, pray, work toward a quick resolution to this conflict. At the same time, let's keep our eyes open. Let's be realists about what is truly before us and prepare accordingly. I'm grateful to you, Reed, for being part of this discussion with me, helping me to learn, helping the audience to learn. And if anyone in our audience has thoughts or comments that they want to share in this regard about how everything is different now and what you are going to do differently as a result, please share that with us. Engage us on social media, on Facebook, on Instagram. Reach out to us through email, airforceofficerpodcast at gmail.com. We would love to have the discussion about how we can think and act differently now that we are fully into near peer competition and have pivoted away from GWAT. Yep, couldn't agree more. Thanks, everybody. That'll do it for this week's episode of Commission Ed.